All right, sorry if it's a little blurry. I had to put on a different lens. Anyway, uh, I'm I'm here in my uh, washroom or my washer dryer room, laundry room, whatever. And uh, it's late at night. I guess it's been pretty humid because of the recent rains and pressure systems in the area. And uh, I guess with that, it brought a little bit of a change in the environment. And now you got a, a splendid activity of arthropods, nocturnal arthropods specifically. And as a lot of you may know, a lot of those nocturnal arthropods are attracted to, uh, to lights. And here, is one of them. This is in the order Hymenoptera, which is the family of bees, ants, and wasps. This one might be in the family Pergidae, which is the family of sawflies. They call these guys sawflies because uh, apparently the female has a saw-like ovipositor. Ovipositor is a structure that insects use to deposit their eggs somewhere, anywhere, really, in the soil, in another insect, in a mammal. This one happens to do it in plants. Its ovipositor is serrated and it kind of saws into those plants and lays its egg in there. Look at those antennae. I assume it's cleaning itself right now. I guess it's not common to know that insects do try to keep themselves clean. Let's go outside, let's go outside. I'll go back out, you can't see it because it's dark. Oh my God. Look at this. Oh, hold on. I'm gonna have to change camera for this. All right, for anybody watching, y'all gonna like this. This is Contia tenuous, otherwise known as the common sharp tailed snake, because of that very sharp point right there at the end of its tail. Uh, there is a species, a new species that they had just recently discovered that looks almost exactly like this which is Contia longicata, where that tail is just much longer and the bars on the, on the belly, on its ventral scutes, are much lighter, I think. But anyway, this is Contia tenuous. This is the first one I've ever seen. I'm from Southern California and these guys, I think they don't get further down south, further than, uh, than Fresno. This is crazy, this is crazy. We wouldn't see any snakes within like 10 miles of where I, where I used to live. So this is nuts right here. So these snakes are in the Colubridae family. So they're related to king snakes, garter snakes, uh, basically uh, a lot of the non-venomous constrictors. Although there are members in the Colubridae that are very venomous, highly venomous, dangerously venomous. Like you'll lose your life if you get bit by them venomous. But we ain't got none of them there in, in North America. The colubrids we have in North America, on the other hand, the vast majority of them are non-venomous like this guy right here. And apparently this species is a leaf litter specialist. The type of surrounding habitat that we have here in Northern California where I'm staying at is a uh, pretty dense oak woodland, a few pines here and there. And these guys just kind of live underneath the leaf litter, which is a nice warm place to be because if you, if you know anything about reptiles, they're uh, pochiliothermic, which means that they have to get the warmth from their environment. And if you're living in leaf litter, all that decaying leaf litter, plus the metabolism from the bacteria and the fungus that is decaying that leaf litter, that's going to release off some heat. If you ever had a compost heap going in your backyard or something like that, and you notice when you dig it up, it feels pretty warm down there. So these guys will live in gardens, leaf litter in gardens, maybe some flower pots or something like that. And they, they eat slugs and slug eggs. And they also eat salamanders, particularly a species of salamander uh, in the genus Retracoseps. And as you can see, it's, it's a pretty calm snake, very calm snake. A child with delicate hands would have a fascinating time with this individual right here. Kind of like how I am. Nice coloration. This one looks fresh. Like it maybe just just shed its skin not too long ago because it looks pretty brand new. Kind of a mean looking face. Like it looks like a super villain out of an Avengers comic book or something like that. And this one is a full grown adult too. They get about a foot long. This one is about a foot long. 
It might even be longer than a foot. They're also known to wander into people's homes and stuff and give housewives and girlfriends a scare. They're a really nice snake. This, this is a good snake to have around when, uh, when you want to teach somebody something, you know? Very nice. You can learn a lot about snake biology. Teach people how snakes are lepidosaurs, how they're closely related to lizards, and ichthyosaurs. And the Loch Ness Monster, apparently, if y'all can believe that. I guarantee somebody, somebody who stumbles upon this video, somebody's gonna be like, oh man, I wanna take that home, keep it as a pet. No, that's wrong. This creature had millions of years to evolve in this current ecosystem. Even though people have built their homes here, let them live. So they do much of a better job living on their own as a functioning component of the ecosystem than they do sitting in a terrarium in your bedroom. I love snakes. This shit is fing dope. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna do the right thing. I'm gonna let it go. And you can see how it's moving itself around, how it's uh, moving its body in that kind of sinusoidal movement. It's grabbing sections of the substrate with one part of its body and throwing its body forward with the other part. Kind of an evolutionary reversal away from legs. It seems to work well on land too. And apparently in aquatic ecosystems too, there are many species of snake that have evolved phenotypes well equipped for swimming. Matter of fact, hundreds of millions of years ago, before even vertebrates existed, maybe some of the first invertebrate worm-like creatures probably all moved around in a similar way too. This is sick, not gonna lie. This is sick. I've seen plenty of snakes, but it's always nice to see a brand new one. Especially a species of snake that you can only find in Western North America. Hell yeah. Okay, I just got back into the laundry room and I saw this massive dipterin right here. That folks. Oh, alright. We're gonna need to contain it somehow. Okay. That massive thing right there, that's what we're after. Now, there's, there's no need to be afraid of these. Like, they're completely harmless. If anything, you should uh, be careful in handling them because they're very brittle, they're very frail, and, uh, you know, you could damage them. Got it. There it is. All right. Oh, hey, that works nice. All right, check it out. Right there we have a member of the order Diptera, which is the order of true flies. So any insect, any flying insect that is a true fly is in that order. Underneath that order Diptera, this one happens to be in the family Typulidae, is known as crane flies. Apparently, a lot of people mistake these for being something called a mosquito hawk. And I'm, I'm, I'm not even sure exactly what a mosquito hawk is. Um, but no, nah, these do not eat mosquitoes. These flying dipterins right here are pollen eaters and nectar eaters. I think some of them might eat dead fruit. Um, but yeah, completely harmless. They don't sting or nothing. They just fly around. This one might be in the genus Typula. And the reason I say that is because it's huge. Typula have aquatic larvae that kind of live in the muddy bank slumps and muddy banks of creeks and maybe rivers. The larvae eat like decaying detritus, decaying leaf litter that fell into the river, maybe even dead fish or dead animals that, you know, find themselves lodged in between rocks or buried underneath sediment and stuff like that. That's the niche that Typula larvae, or many, or that some species of Typula larvae have, uh, have filled. And then of course, since this one has wings, it's an adult. And right now it's it's just kind of flying around, maybe browsing for food. Maybe, maybe, just maybe come in contact with a male to mate. And then once she's nice and impregnated, she'll head back to some type of aquatic source, like a small creek or stream, or maybe even sewer gutter or something like that. And she'll lay her eggs. And then uh, the cycle of life starts all over again for these. Now this one's huge. This one is, uh, I mean, you can see it right next to my hand. It's pretty big. It's maybe about, I don't know, five, 
five centimeter wingspan. The front of the proboscis all the way to the to the posterior end is maybe about three centimeters. So this is this is a pretty big flying dipterin. And one of the things I like about crane flies is you can see a very significant uh, characteristic of diptera evolution. And what I'm talking about are those little knob thingies sticking out the back of the thorax right there. As you know, all insects have two pairs of wings. That is four wings. They have a front pair and a rear pair or a hind pair. Well, what dipterans have done is they've kind of gotten rid of the hind pair and turned them into these little nub-like structures called halteres. All dipterans have these. Crane flies, horse flies, shit flies, blow flies, flesh flies, they all have these. And although halteres don't aid in lift, they do aid in flying. They act more of as a sensory structure, sensing air pressure, wind currents, wind direction, etc., etc. Okay, I just got the crazy idea that we should kind of move away from the light source and uh, see what hangs out in the darkness. After catching that sharp-tailed snake, uh, I was thinking to myself, like, hey, there's a bunch of leaf litter around here. Let's uh, see what else is in the leaf litter. Go. Hey. Oh, wow. Hey. Oh, oh, oh. There we go. All right, right here we have an example of a millipede species that uh, apparently is like pooping all over me, but that's fine, I, I disturbed it, so no problem. Wanted to bring it in the light so I could show on camera. I'm not exa entirely sure what species of millipede this is, but I can tell you that it is in the spira spirabolida taxon of, uh, of millipedes. Millipedes are in the phylum Myriapoda, which includes millipedes, centipedes, Basically, a lot of the extant arthropods that, uh, that have multiple legs. So you can see on my hands, uh, it's secreting some type of uh, liquid. That's a, that's a defense liquid. Uh, it has uh, noxious chemicals in it that smell pretty bad. There's a component in that chemical uh, called quinones. Quinones, I don't know how you pronounce it. But uh, it can cause some brown staining on your skin if it comes in contact with it. Uh, which is most definitely what's going to happen to me right now. I don't even know how long that stain's going to last, but uh, hey, free experiment, I guess. But really, it's just a it's it's a really effective um, deterrent for anything that might want to eat something like this. All right, I'm seeing this uh, dehiss flower, and uh, it is now decaying on top of this leaf litter in between this fence and this shed. And I see something crawling in there, and I'm gonna try to check it out. There it is. There it is. Oh, right there, right there, right there. Oh, oh, oh. There we go. All right, trying to bring this one into the light. I had to bring it inside so I could put it in a container. <laughs> but there it is, right there. That's what we found right there. I think it was feeding on that, on that fallen flower over there. Anyway, this is a coleopterin. Coleopterin meaning beetles. This is in the family Carabidae, or ground beetles. And these are also detritivores. However, I think, uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of Carabids are also predatory. So they'll eat other insects and worms and maybe slugs and slug eggs and stuff like that. A lot of Carabids also produce a noxious chemical that uh, is kind of similar, at least in smell, to what that millipede would put out. When I grabbed it, I can smell this one kind of putting out something too, but um, it's not as bad as the millipede, to be honest. I'm gonna move this into a plastic bag to show you something else. Here you go. Plastic bag against the white backdrop so you can easily see the shape of this particular coleopterin right here. Again, I mentioned it was in the family Carabidae, which is the family of ground beetles, which are usually beetles that specialize in, well, you know, living on the ground, but also within leaf litter layers, and uh, underneath rocks, et cetera, et cetera. Kind of like a terrestrial infauna type of organism, or I guess a mesofauna or something like that. I think mesofauna refers to organisms that live in between layers or something else. In this case, I guess this one would kind of live in between the leaf layer and the soil layer 
uh, in some type of forest environment, which is where we're at right now. The reason why I have it in this plastic bag is because uh, I can easily just uh, flip it over like that to show you its underside. Yo, I'm gonna need my lens for this, hold on. All right, okay, okay, there, that's better, that's better. All right, the reason why I have it in this plastic bag is to show you that right there. Um, I'm gonna put arrows in this, but uh, this is basically one of the distinguishing characteristics of the Karabidae family. Not all Karabids have this, but if you see those little bean-like structures near the femora of the hind legs, uh, most Karabids have that. Those are probably used in uh, some sort of locomotive advantage. Ground beetles are pretty fast beetles. There are species of ground beetles called tiger beetles, which like to live on uh, kind of the shore, sandy shore margins or, or mud margins of wetland systems and everything. And those are some pretty damn fast beetles. These carabids are pretty fast too, but not, not nowhere near as fast as tiger beetles. I also wanted to show you that. Beetles have really nice, good examples of mandibular mouth parts and jaw parts those menacing looking uh, pincer like mouth parts right there those are the mandibles those little two things sticking out of the uh, like kind of near the mandibles like above the mandibles I believe those are the maxillary palpi those are basically just appendages that kind of help stuff food into its mouth it's like those mandibles will take chunks out of something and those palpi will kind of push it into its mouth they don't really have like throat muscles like vertebrates or tongues that can actually help aid in swallowing. So they have these, uh, all insects I should say, have these appendages that help kind of move chunks of food, whatever it is. And if it's like a piece of a mushroom, a piece of plant, or a piece of another animal, uh, those palpi help stuff it into their mouths. And many insect taxa are differentiated by the shapes of their palpi, the structures of them, where they're located, etc., etc. Oh, that nice uh, serrated antennae. I guess that's what you would call it. I don't know, serrated or moniliform. I think that's the shape of that antennae. I think that's what it's called. Many insects have different shapes of antennae. And a lot of families, or a lot of subfamilies and specific groups of insects are distinguished by the shapes of their antennae. This one here appears to be, I think, moniliform or serrated. I don't know, or some, some, somewhere in between. Menacing mouth parts right there. Yeah, I guess that's about it. So, uh, we just had a surprisingly successful session biologizing my washroom or my laundry room and the backyard. A freaking snake showed up. That's pretty hard. That's pretty dope. That's that's kind of kind of makes me happy and uh, reassures me that I'm in the right spot. Um, anyway, yeah. So uh, the the biology of a washroom at night during the spring, and what critters you might encounter, and why you should or should not be afraid of them. Most of them you shouldn't. Uh, so you know, just just learn more about it. Just learn something, and then you'll be less scared. Peace up, peace out, learn something.